Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. We'll see how this goes today. I have my neighbor having their lawn mowed outside, so I'm not sure if that's going to cause some problems or not, but we'll see how it goes. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about another article. Today is fall applied nitrogen. There is a, a review article that I highly recommend everybody go read. I started highlighting some of the topics and some of the comments and the content that I wanted to make sure I cover today and I ended up basically highlighting half the article. So <laughs> it's best just to go find it and read the whole thing. <clears throat> so let's take a look at it. So today is the agronomic and physiological responses of cool season turf grass to fall applied nitrogen. It is an article that was published in Crop Science in 2012. So please do yourself a favor. If you've ever wondered the value or benefit or the risk associated with fall applied nitrogen, go just get this paper and most of everything you'll need to know is in here, or there's a reference to some other article um, in this article that you can then go read their, their, you know, research and so forth. So um, as always, we start with what is, what is the objective or what is the, the observation? Why is this article even written for, uh, and for, Turf grasses, fall applied nitrogen is, is a fairly common practice, uh, particularly in the cool season environments. A lot of this is a result of some research that was done in the 60s by Dr. Powell uh, here in Lexington, Kentucky. Um, actually, he did the research in Virginia, but he ended up coming to Kentucky. Um, and a lot of the, um, um, I don't know, the management practices and a lot of the research that was done after that was was a result of um, some of his conclusions and, and findings. So um, a lot of his content is mentioned in this paper and we're going to get to that. But that's the reason why this research exists. This paper exists is because um, a lot of managers, and a lot of turf managers were applying nitrogen in the fall still are. And th there wasn't much support of that practice other than just anecdotal or observational. So um, AJ did some work and found that indeed there is some benefit to applying those um, fall applications. And we're going to go into that. So, but that, but that's the reason that this work exists. So where would you go find this article? You can either um, Google fall applied nitrogen to turf grass, or you can go to the turf grass information file at Michigan state search for, um, you know, fall applied nitrogen and, um, and, um, you should be able to find this, this article. <clears throat> so if, you, when you do find it in crop science magazine or journal, um, it's likely that it's going to be behind a paywall. I don't know if this is open access or not. I don't, I didn't actually, well, let's just go look for it. Let's see if it's open access. Let's see if I can find it. So for those who uh, want to follow along with what I'm doing here, um, let's, let's not do that. Let's do, uh, let's see. Crops, so I'll just, I'll just Google. I'm sorry, I'll just go to crops.org and you'll want to go to publications and go to journals. I'm not sure why. Um, give me one minute here. Let's see if I can find. Let me see if this pops up now. Okay. So you go to crops.org. And you'll go to publications, journals, just anywhere in journals. You'll go down to crop science, 
if you're not a member of the American Society of Agronomy, this would be a good time to consider it. This is where a lot of our research is published. And you will, I'll just, I'll just Google fall applied nitrogen or just search fall applied nitrogen. Let's see if it's behind a, a paywall. So here it is. So see if this is uh, open access or not. Doesn't look like it is. Anyway, you can still read the abstract. How do I, let's see here. PDF. Yeah, so it's behind a paywall. <clears throat> well, anyway, you can go find it there. If you're a member, you can download it. Um, you can read the abstract. You can go to your library or even a public library, do it the old school way. If you're having difficulty finding some of these articles, you can actually go to um, uh, a, a library and find this. If you're a student or if you're on campus, you can always always download articles uh, on, the on the campus uh, library. Or you can go to the public library and do an interlibrary loan to get the article or journal. You may have to put some effort in to, to, to get this, these articles, but they are available. And, um, you know, you may, you may have to put some, some time and effort in to find it. But um, do yourself a favor. This, this particular article is, is worth the time to go find. So anyway, that's, how you, that's why it's here. That's how you would go find it. So let's start getting through it. So... First thing I generally do, we'll read the read the abstract. You can kind of get an idea as to what the content will be, some of the take home messages. And um, in this particular article, we see um, that the, the, the abstract says nitrogen is the mineral nutrient mo most limiting for turf grass. Da, 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 da. Rising energy and subsequent end costs and environmental concerns have pressured turf grass managers to schedule applications to maximize and use efficiency. And then here you go late fall nitrogen. Fertilization for cool season turf grass is widely accepted practice. So this is sort of the observation. You can go down through here. It's, this is all a review of existing literature. So they didn't actually go out and do the work. They actually um, did a review of the existing literature and published that. So in many ways, this is um, like a, a succinct uh, source of what the body of literature on this topic is. Uh, so this literature review finds the often cited physiological and agronomic benefits of applied late fall nitrogen are poorly supported by peer review research. Hmm. <laughs> With the exception of fall and spring color responses. So basically, if you don't even want to go through this article and, and bother reading all the content, what this is saying is everything that you have heard or that you you're doing you're applying nitrogen for with the exception of fall and spring color is not really supported by any any research that we've found any any of the the research we've published or the work that we've done it doesn't show that it's providing any benefit other than fall and spring color and that that might be what you're looking for you might, you might only be looking for fall color and spring color and if that's the case um then that would be a benefit there's going to be some some catches to that that we're going to go over but um if you're looking for fall and spring color then by all means this is a, a, a you know a valid approach to to you know creating that uh, but if you're looking for root growth and carbohydrate reserves and all these other things it, we just don't have any any evidence to support that at this point so um, that's what the abstract says so um if you want to go into it deeper that's what we're going to do so the article starts off with an introduction and basically explains what the situation is and what the observations are and so forth. Why are they doing it? That's what most introductions will do. Um, it goes through, you know, what is the situation? What is the problem that this is even, why are they even publishing this paper? So I certainly encourage everybody to read through this. Um, the introductions will help provide a, a, a background knowledge and understanding of, of what exists in the literature and um, why they're doing what they're doing and so forth. Okay, so we're going to skip ahead <laughs> and we're going to go to the uh, paragraph here that says color quality and growth responses. And this paragraph um, uh, summarizes AJ's work over in Virginia. So we're going to read through here and kind of give you a, a, a general setting foundation as to the really the first comprehensive study on fall applied nitrogen. Um, on turf grasses. So 
uh, these reports followed research performed in Virginia on creeping bent grass and tall fescue. So, so AJ did work on creeping bent grass and tall fescue in Virginia. That's, that's going to be important because the climate zone later on, you're going to find that the climate zones are going, it's the, the influence is going to change based upon the more, where the turf grass is growing. Or so we're seeing some benefit in, in say, um, New England area and Virginia area, that's mid Atlantic area. We don't see those same benefits in say the Northern, um, central United States. Um, and we're going to, we're going to talk about that. So these researchers concluded that late fall and winter infertilization of cool season grass in Virginia improved year round color and quality without stimulating foliar growth in the winter. So basically they're saying they, they showed some benefits, um, without excessive growth immediately following the application when it was applied in the fall. At the same time, fall in was considered detrimental to cold acclim acclimation. Um, it was considered that way, but Powell also reported that fall and winter in application did not decrease the cold hardness of cool season turf grass. So this, um, this notion that existed in the sixties, that, um, there would be some detrimental effect to applying it in the fall. Uh, it wasn't discovered or it wasn't published by Powell. He didn't find that Powell studied examined cumulative studies, examined cumulative fall and winter in rates. And it has the various end rates. Remember 49 kilograms per hectare is one pound. So whenever you're reading through scientific literature, if you have uh, <laughs> the interest in doing so, um, if you're, or if you're starting, you haven't had the interest and maybe you are interested now in maybe reading through and seeing what exists in literature, um, it might take you a little bit of time to kind of acclimate yourself to the units. Just remember 49 kilograms per hectare is one pound of nitrogen per thousand square feet. So 98 is two and so forth. So in rates of, of these rates applied as ammonium nitrate using one to five applications. Oh, remember the days of ammonium nitrate. It was so nice. We had two forms, ammonium and nitrate. And, you know, the turf grass responses to those were great. And then Oklahoma City bombing happened, which happened when I was in Oklahoma. And I remember driving um, to pick up some documents and the Oklahoma, I heard a pop. I heard like a it was almost like a shotgun sound. I was, I, I'm 50 or 27 miles away and I heard something and I was like, what in the world? And I ended up getting to where I was going and everybody in the building was freaking out. I was like, what's going on? You know, and, then, and then the bombing happened while I was, that's, that's what that little pop was. I heard anyway, um, that happened and now we can't use ammonium nitrate to any extent. You can, but it's extremely difficult to acquire anyway. Um, they use it as ammonium nitrate. Or they applied it as ammonium nitrate in October, uh, between October and February water and soluble nitrogen was also applied at the rate of 490 kilograms of N per hectare. So water and soluble nitrogen was applied at 10 pounds per thousand square feet, which sounds ludicrous, but some of these slow release in sources, well, 10 pounds is excessive, but, um, in research, we kind of do these things. We, we go way out there to see where the limit is. But 10 pounds of slow release nitrogen actually might be suitable in some cases, particularly in research where we're trying to find rates. Anyway, all high end rates examined on bent grass 147 to 490, regardless of the timing, generally improved turf color throughout the winter and into the spring compared to low end rates. Of course, you're applying more nitrogen, you're going to see a, 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 a more pronounced response. Growth was relatively unaffected during the winter months. However, growth in the spring was significantly increased by the high end rates compared to the low end rates. Okay. So basically they're applying a variety of end rates in the fall and, and they, they different months, and they're not seeing a great deal of growth in the winter, but they see the growth in the, in, in the spring. And they, they do see some in the fall from the soluble end sources. If you really want to go into the, the various, uh, resources they use in this publication, you can go through here and you'll see these tables and it has the citation where they, where they, um, pulled it from and the various variables they, they measured and the dates and a lot of some of the details that of these various, uh, research publications, um, did. Okay. So, but that, that's basically PAL study. They did some um, applications in the fall and they, they did some different rates. They use ammonium nitrate and, um, and they uh, found that there was a benefit in terms of color in the fall and the spring. Okay. But that's, that's sort of a good foundation to us to understand why uh, this uh, is, a, is a management practice. Um, but other researchers after Powell, after AJ, they started looking at other variables in other regions and they start finding, um, different, different things. And so we want to go over that. 
in this paragraph, we're looking at um, uh, some work that was done by Wayne in Wisconsin. And uh, he also found improved spring color with late fall and dormant end treatments using different sources, although a spring growth response was also attributed to these late fall and winter treatments. None of the research performed in the Midwest United States reported winter injury as a result of late fall nitrogen. So again, we have another researcher finding that there was no um, ill effects or detrimental effects in terms of winter injury with these fall applied nitrogen. So the risk to the plant is fairly low. That's what the researchers are finding or found. So when we go to root growth, um, these the idea is that, or the, the notion is, is that <clears throat> fall applied nitrogen increases root growth or it gives, it gives the plant some opportunity to enhance the carbohydrate reserves before going into winter. Um, but we generally have not found that's the case. Uh, so. Uh, research evaluating the effects of fall applied nitrogen on late, root, late season root development has yielded mixed results. Okay. Powell evaluated winter root growth on bent grass, the same study, 1967, as affected by fall applied nitrogen. Data collected during February indicated that winter rooting increased approximately 30% in treatments that received no fertilizer or low end rates. So basically the control had had 30 percent increased uh increased rooting in this in in that time frame however however later by april no treatments treated di treatment differences were apparent and by june the treatments receiving the nitrogen rates here um, between october and february so october november december january and february had 40 to 50 percent greater root mass respectfully okay so early on the the no end had greater and later on, the um, turf grass that received in had greater in the summer. Okay, so there's some there's some beneficial data there. Um, so let's let's continue. So in Iowa, more, um, and I don't know if that's I don't I'm not sure, uh, well anyway more compared the effects of late fall heavy spring and balanced in fertilizer programs on Kentucky bluegrass root growth. The late fall program, which included a one pound in 49 kilograms application in November produced nine and 18% more root mass than the spring and balanced in. So here again, there's some, you know, evidence there that, you know, this late fall might result in a little bit more root root growth. Um, we could keep going down. Consequently, the rooting studies performed by Powell and Hansen and Hansen and Juska in 1961 in the Mid-Atlantic yielded results that may not be applicable to cooler climates where air temperature decreases to near or below freezing for extended periods. Fall in rooting studies performed north of the Mid-Atlantic region did not find root mass differences as a result of in applied in either September, October, November, December. So what this is saying is, is that the clim climate of the region, the, the environment where some of these studies were done, meaning Virginia, New Hampshire, New England area, where it's a little bit warmer, showed some benefit, sometimes, you know, sometimes arguably not agronomically significant. Sometimes it was agronomically significant to, to root growth from fall applied nitrogen but in a regions where it's much colder i.e wisconsin um they they not they're not finding that and the the um, assertion is is that that's a result of the the soil temperatures or just the temperatures in general being too cold and so you can't take and this this is an example of where you can't take data from virginia and apply it to Wisconsin just because it's on bent grass. Oh, it's the same plant. Well, it is the same plant, but it's a different environment. In Virginia, you might get zero or one degree Celsius. In Wisconsin, you, you know, you'd be lucky to get up to zero or one degree Celsius in, in the winter. So um, that's an example of um, you, uh, where you don't want to assume uh, that you're gonna find similar results um, because it was in different climate, different different temperatures, different soils, and different systems, and so forth. So sometimes you can do that, but oftentimes the environmental conditions differ so much that you you wouldn't um, expect to see the same results. And that's what that's what they're showing here. Okay, so reserve um, carbohydrates are often. So he says reserve non-structural carbohydrates are beneficial for turf grass to withstand and recover from periods of stress. So. 
historically, this was one of the primary reasons to, to withhold in fertilizer in the fall, as in applications was thought to expend reserve carbohydrates. So the idea was you're applying nitrogen in the fall. It's that they, they, they believed that it was going to deplete all those carbohydrates and, and result in the turf grass being more susceptible to stresses that might occur because it wouldn't have a reserve to pull from. That was the thought process. Okay. Currently, this was in the 60s. Currently, the, uh, the accumulation of reserve carbohydrates is often listed among the benefits of late fall fertilization. And there's a number of citations for that for that um, conclusion. However, there are no research reports available to fully support this claim. Okay, so what this is saying is, is that the it, it's listed as a benefit. Some people will still have that noted as I'm, I'm applying it to to increase the, the reserve carbohydrates for stressful periods. But there's not any, what this is saying is there's, there's, there are no research reports available to fully support this claim. There, there, in other words, it's just an observation. It's just anecdotal. There's no evidence to support it. So if you're applying late fall nitrogen um, because you think it's going to in, increase the carbohydrate reserves, I would, I would caution you on that. Um, on that reason, it's, it's doesn't. It's not a very sound reason. And it says, while possibly true for the Mid Atlantic region, this scenario is not as likely for cool regions. Okay, in Massachusetts, an inverse relationship was found between soil temperatures and total soil carbohydrates and turf grass, as well as consistently lower carbohydrate throughout the season if turf grass on, in turf grass receiving nitrogen. Okay, so. It may be, may or may not be true in some regions, but it, it, it's going to be different depending on the temperatures in the regions that the, the turf grass is growing. Okay. In Pennsylvania, Wachke and Waddington also observed lower carbohydrate levels in fall fertilized treatments, which they attributed to a growth response in October. The next team evaluated fall applied nitrogen and found no significant difference in total car non-structural carbohydrate levels between fertilized and unfertilized plants going into winter. So in other words, these are two studies, one in 74 and 185, one showing that lower carbohydrates was a result of fall applied nitrogen and the other showing there were no differences in, in, in fertilized. And so in other words, the evidence supporting that there's going to be an increase following fall applied nitrogen apparently doesn't exist doesn't at least not to the degree that you'd feel confident in in using that as a reason to apply fall nitrogen so i would say that there's the jury still out on on fall applied nitrogen when it comes to uh, reserve carbohydrates but certainly there's not sufficient evidence to um to use that as a good reason to apply it Okay, it seems like either there's not going to be um, much of an increase in fall uh, in reserve carbohydrates, or there may be a decrease in reserve non-structural carbohydrates. To show an increase is is there's not there's not a good it's not a very good uh, reason to to do that. There's not a lot of evidence to support that. So let's look at photosynthesis. The plant net carbon energy balance mentioned by Powell described the underlying assumption for many of the frequently proclaimed fall in benefits. As the plant is actively photosynthesizing and low temperatures are limiting top growth, the carbohydrate production must be used elsewhere in the plant, either by either for below ground root and rhizome development, tailoring or reserve carbohydrate storage. So that's sort of like the presupposition, I suppose. Okay. Um, the accompanying notion is that if the plant is met metabolically active, in uptake will continue as long as photosynthesis is still occurring. Okay. Um, however, the measurements of turf grass photosynthesis in cool temperatures are rare. Okay. In Virginia, again, PAL 67 measured photosynthesis of creeping grass. 
on plots that had been treated with fall and winter nitrogen at ranges, da, 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 they observed the highest annual net photosynthesis rates in January when night temperatures did not reach freezing. So basically the idea that you're going to apply nitrogen and you're going to increase photosynthesis in the winter from a fall plot, fall nitrogen, you're going to increase photosynthesis in the winter. Um, uh, it's pretty rare to actually have any data at all. The, because it's winter, there's snow on the ground or there's ice on the ground. There's not a lot of research out there with people, you know, going out and using a, a Lycor to measure photosynthesis on turf grass with ice on it. So, or, or frozen soil or whatever. So there's just not a lot of data there. It might be true, might not be true, but we need someone to go out there and actually do the work. I think, I think most researchers just kind of assume that there's not much photosynthesis going on when there's, you know, snow or ice in the ground. But, and that's basically what this is saying is that, you know, there, there's just, it's just, it's rare to have photosynthesis measured uh, in cool temperatures in, in the, in the winter. So we don't know, but there's a good, good chance. It's probably not the case, but we don't really know. We don't have enough really evidence there to really, you know, form a conclusion one, you know, one way or the other. Anyway, we're going to keep going. Uh, plant uptake of a fall of a fall applied in. So fertilizer applications effectiveness can be assessed in many ways. And these authors, it says, we feel that per the percentage of applied in recovered by the plant represents the best way of evaluating and comparing in application rates and timings from agronomic, economic, and environmental perspectives. So these authors feel that basically balancing the, the ends of fate and measuring and, and, and uh, within that, knowing you know how much was taken up by the plan is, is the best way to measure how effective the fall applied in is. Uh, that's certainly a, a, valid, um, a valid approach. Um, so let's see what they found. Although tissue or root in concentrations were not collected during the fall, total fall in uptake appears to be substantially lower than recommended application rates. So what you can read through this whole thing if you want. But basically what it's saying is, is that what they're finding in terms of fall uptake is much lower than the recommended application rates. Um, generally speaking, we'll, we'll get between... 30, 40, 50 percent uptake. I think they even has it up here. Recover is OK. 30 and 60 percent. That's pretty good. 60. Anything above 60 is rare, but very good. And usually it's around 50 percent is, you know, pretty good. And um, what they're saying is, is that the amount that the plant is taking up is so much lower than the app, than the current recommended application rates for for these fall applied uh, nitrogen you know, management practices. So um, that's something to be note to be be aware of. Other research evaluating plant physiological responses in low temperatures suggests that turf grass is less proficient at taking up in the late fall in northern climates than is often assumed. Okay. Um, it's not very efficient once temperatures hit, even if it is a cool season grass, once it hits its critical temperature limit and, and the metabolic processes start to slow, the uptake of in is, is very, very low, even in bluegrass and fescues and bents that are, you know, that, that operate at those lower temperatures, the, uh, the uptake is still quite low. So going out with, you know, two or three pounds or something crazy that would, um, that would you know, you know, perhaps half that might be a little high. That, that seems excessive. So, um, yeah. So Jay, the, you know, the question in the chat is, does the study say if it matters how the end was applied? It does. There's, there, it, it does matter whether it's soluble or slow release. It does matter the amount that was applied, either soluble or slow release. It does matter whether or not it was a foliar applied or granular applied. And what I'm, what I'm trying to do is just kind of go through here and hit the highlights and kind of make it more practical. If you want the details of the, of the work, you can go through here and actually read the details. Um, they do a pretty good job of explaining exactly how each research um, project was conducted. And if they don't include it, you can always go down in the reference and find that actual article and download that specific one. Like for example, Frank et al. 2006, you can go down and find that article and find a lot more information in detail on that specific study. Uh, but it does matter. Um, the, the soluble in sources uh, are generally um, uh, more effective in the fall than slow release because the the release from those slow release nitrogen sources is oftentimes so slow 
that the turf grass demand for it um, isn't met because the release from the nitrogen source is is too slow at that time. So soluble in sources um, that provide the greatest opportunity for uptake when the when the soil and the temperatures are low are generally what the research will support. And you can find that in here. The yeah, the, the slow release in sources have value. Um, there's definitely some areas where you'll find um, um, that slow release in sources do or, or do have an advantage, but it's sure not in the price <laughs> category, okay? <laughs> and it's not necessarily the quality category. It's not necessarily the environmental fate category. It's really the, oh crap, I messed up category. You know, like if you accidentally dump a bag on the turf and slow release nitrogen sources can be removed, you know, and you won't kill it as easily. Or you accidentally doubled the rate and you don't want to burn Miss Jones's lawn. It's really the slow release in sources are are good for that. It gives you a little bit of a buffer, but you can achieve equally environmental uh, reductions of risk, equal increases in turf quality from soluble as you can from slow. You just have to know what you're doing with them. So anyway, you can go through here and find some of that information. Um, we're getting down to the end here. So one reason in uptake may be down down regulated during periods of low growth. Remember, we're talking about we're talking about plant uptake of in here, and uh, this is from a Bowman study. So it is it, it appears of low growth is because in is not needed in the production of new amino acids, nucleic acids, and enzymes for new shoot growth for which Bowman accounted for 80, oh, did I say N is not needed in the product? One reason N uptake may be downgraded during periods of low growth. During periods of low growth, that N is not used to the same extent in those, in those um, molecules in the plant. Evapotranspiration is also decreased markedly in cold, cold temperatures, diminishing the N transfer. So basically, it, the, the, what these two paragraphs are saying, this, this paragraph is saying is that the demand for N in terms of assimilation into proteins and amino acids is lower, and the actual flow of N into the plant through evapotranspiration is also much slower. It's much lower in the fall and in, in the cool temperatures. So um, the N uptake is, we're not talking about like August and September in Kentucky or Tennessee. We're talking about November or December where it's much, much colder the demand for in in the plant has been greatly reduced and the ability to take in up into the plant has also been greatly reduced. That's what these, this paragraph is saying. That's critical. I think that's a key point to make sure we understand is that, um, the demand's low, the ability to take it up in the plant is low. So applying these high rates in November and December, um, yes, you might get something down the line um, as a benefit, but there's going to be environmental consequences, which happens to be the very next paragraph. So Petrovic 90, if you have never read uh, Petrovic's 1990 paper, it's probably the most cited paper on the fate of nitrogen applied to turf grass. In fact, that's the title. Um, so I'll definitely go into that paper at some point in the future, but I highly encourage you all to to uh, download that and read it. It really goes through all the different fates of nitrogen. He compiled a comprehensive review of leaching studies and conducted for turf grass and suggested that there is greater potential for leaching losses from late fall in due to color temperature restriction, restricting plant uptake and decreased microbial mobilization of in in the soil. He speculated that while, high, while late fall in fertilization has potential agronomic benefits, which is what we've been talking about, the environmental consequence may overshadow the benefit, basically. So, yes, you can, you know, go get Botox and you look good for a day. But the the long-term disadvantage, which I don't even know the long-term disadvantage of Botox, but you may have long-term consequences that might not, it might be too much. And that's, that's what we're finding with late fall nitrogen, yes, you're going to see some benefits. Of course, you're going to see color responses in the fall and the, and the, and the spring. Those are You'll see those. Um, but you're not going to see some of the other benefits, which, which we've already gone over. And the environmental risk, the potential for losses of nitrogen is greatly increased because the plant's not taking it up. Okay. In Ohio, uh, this study reported higher nitrogen leaching losses in the winter from Kentucky bluegrass fertilized on a program emphasizing late fall in. Okay. Um, in, 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 as compared to programs emphasizing spring and summer in. So 
what they did in Ohio was they applied fall and spring, da, 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 and they measured the leaching, um, the nitrogen leaching. And you can go download this article, which are on uh, 1993. And they showed that applying it in the fall, yes, you're going to see a color response, but you're going to have more nitrate leaching. And I know, you know, some people don't get warm and fuzzy about the environment. Some people do. Uh, one way or the other, whether you are an environmental environmentalist or you're not, or whether or not you're an, a capitalist or you're not, you're losing the nitrogen that you paid for. So you're, lo you're, you're reducing the efficient use of the nitrogen that you paid for. So if you're not warm and fuzzy on the environment, you're probably warm and fuzz fuzzy on money. And you, what it's saying is you're losing money by applying it in that at that time frame that you didn't need to lose if you applied it in the fall. I mean, I'm sorry, in the spring. That's what this is saying, okay? So high winter leaching losses were attributed to low temperatures and reduced plant and microbe activity. So it doesn't matter to me what side of the coin you're on, whether you're an environment or capitalist or whether you're both, whatever the case is, keep in mind that you're losing money and you're increasing environmental risk um, by applying some of these uh, nitrogen uh, sources, particularly high nitrogen rates uh, in the fall when you can easily achieve the same response and, and reduce your environmental risk and, and potentially increase your profit by applying at a time of year that is less susceptible to nitrogen leaching. So this research suggests that late fall apply applications of soluble in fertilizers to mature turf grass. So this is one pound of in, don't forget 49 is one pound of in or greater should be avoided to minimize leaching losses. So if again, you're not environmental, just say it should be avoided to maximize profits, <laughs> whatever floats your boat. Okay. Miltner, Eric did some studies out in Washington uh, 20, 25 years ago and recommended eliminating single, single dose one pound in applications in the late fall due to replant re reduced plant uptake. So they found that in Washington as well. Um, another study in 97 compared nitrate leaching from three cool season turf grasses within applications between uh, three, this is three pounds in over two growing seasons in Rhode Island. The highest soil water nitrate concentration occurred during winter months with tall fescue deemed most efficient at absorbing nitrate compared to cutting blue. That's pretty common in the literature. You'll find tall fescue is generally um, better at absorbing it probably due to its um, growth habit. Kentucky bluegrass is usually cut quite low and fescue can be cut two, three, four inches if it needs to be. Um, so we're finding multiple studies that are showing similar results, and that is fall applied nitrogen, particularly from soluble sources, uh, particularly late in the fall, uh, will will increase your environmental risk and reduce your profitability if, if you can apply that at a different time of year. So greatest annual leaching losses occurred in late fall and early spring period with the ammonium nitrate source as compared to polymer coated, sulfur coated urea or organic in. So this, these are slow release in sources uh, that that will reduce that often result in reduction in, in applied nitrogen being leached. Um, if, if these ammonium nitrate soluble sources are applied uh, according to their release characteristics, uh, the differences between these can be uh, negligible. So, but if you apply them with disregard to how the product, how the nitrogen is released, meaning if you apply soluble in at two pounds in late fall or say in early winter, then yes, you're, you, that's not the way that product should be applied. It should be applied at a lower rate. But the, but the slow release might need to be applied at one or two pounds to get its response, right? So if you're applying them just, okay, we're going to apply them all at two pounds and we're going to be described, then you'll see differences between these nitrogen sources. Um, the last one here is, okay, they reported greater nitrate leaching losses and in fertilizer losses from applications made later into the fall, concluding that fall, late fall fertilization in New England could be replaced by lower in application rates. So again, we're finding multiple studies in multiple locations saying essentially the same thing is that very late fall or early winter nitrogen applications are likely to result in increasing the leaching of the nitrogen when you're when you're applying it as soluble. Okay, so be careful with that. Oftentimes that's why you see the best management practices um, include those as, as management practices because of stuff like this, where we've done the research and we've published it. So when we get to the conclusions, which if you're, if you haven't seen any other videos, you, you, you then uh, I'll tell you now, I like to 
cheat. <laughs> I'll read the abstract and I'll read the last sentence or two in the abstract, kind of get an idea what the paper concluded. And then I'll just skip all the way to the conclusions. And if there's really something interesting, I'm like, then I go back and start reading the article. I know they're probably not supposed to do that, but I, that's the way I do it. Uh, so some of the highlights and the conclusions, the research regarding environmental losses of soluble in applied in the late fall indicate a potential for significant in losses through leaching, bringing into question the actual cost benefit of fall applied nitrogen. So if I fail to do this, I'm going to I'm going to make a, I'm going to say it now is that when we say in will leach or in is going to leach, scientists shouldn't say that. Okay, so if I've said that, I don't mean to. What, it, what, I'm, what we should always say is that it has it brings the potential for significant in loss, or it has a potential for environmental risk, or it's an element of potential environmental impairment. Um, nitrogen and phosphorus are elements of potential environmental impairment. If applied correctly, according to our best management practices, that likelihood is extremely low. But to go around and say nitrogen and phosphorus are are elements of impairment is not doing ourselves justice it's putting it's it, you know it's it's putting the wrong context it they are potential but not it doesn't mean they will or they are that way so we want to be mindful of how we use our language in that regard the main reason that that in fertilization in the late fall is so highly regarded appears to be based on the assumption of increased photosynthesis and rooting However, there is minimal research on turf grass photosynthesis at low temperatures, and what has been reported does not unambiguous. Well, I should just say does and does ambiguously support. But it's a double negative. Does not unambiguously support such a benefit. So this idea that you're going to increase photosynthesis, you're going to increase carbohydrate reserves, and increase rooting. There's you can just there's just don't don't assume that that's true. Until because there, there's not a, enough evidence just to to lean towards one way or the other, it may be true. But until we somebody comes out and has some good evidence, then we just we're just in the middle. You know, we don't we don't assume it's true or not true. Applying this notion of increased photosynthesis from late fall in fertilization across all cool season turf grass zones and species without supporting research is unwarranted. So this is critical. Yes, they did some research in Virginia. Yes, they did some research in in uh, New Hampshire or wherever, or wherever there was Connecticut. Um, they do some research in Washington, whatever, and they find certain things in certain regions, but that you can't just take those results and, and, and apply them wherever you're at. You can't do that. Okay. It's critical that we understand that there are differences between turf grasses and regions and soils and, 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 and we have, we need more site specific um, research, um, to, to really have a lot of confidence. Yes. You can have some confidence that AJ's research is potentially useful for you. You can have some, but don't bet the whole farm on it. Spe specifically, if you're in, you know, Northeast Oklahoma and Tulsa or something, and you're like, oh, well, they found this in Virginia. Well, that's Virginia. Okay. It may be relevant to you, but it may not be. Uh, so so we, we just want to be mindful and very careful about how we just assume that these things will be the case where you are. Last thing, similarly, the perspective of late Perception that late fall fertilization hastens spring green up without a surge of top growth also appears to be highly dependent upon the species and season seasonal weather condition. Furthermore, scant data are available defining the uptake potential of cool season grasses and cool temperatures. What do exist indicate potential indicate uptake potential is low, suggesting that recommended late fall in fertilizer rates are too high. So to summarize this whole thing up is, okay, to summarize this whole thing, if you're applying late fall nitrogen, there's a very good, or fall nitrogen, there's a very good chance you're going to see an increase in color. You're going to, in, in the fall and in the spring compared to um, not applying fall nitrogen, right? So you're going to see an increase in color. You're probably not going to see an increase in rooting. You're probably not going to see an increase in photosynthesis or carbohydrate or non-structural carbohydrates. You're not going to. We're not probably not going to see that. There's not anything to really support that that claim. You're also probably going to find that a, a, a portion of the nitrogen is is leaching where it didn't need to leach if you applied it in the spring. You could you could have avoided that and applied it in the spring and reduced that potential leaching loss okay so 
yes, we still recommend applying applying fall nitrogen in Kentucky, in Tennessee, and in North, where there's you know September and October are our months that we like to apply. But we're applying those in the fall when the grass is still actively growing. When when we move into November and December, when the turf grass begins to really slow down. These applications are highly questionable at this point. One, because the plant's not going to take it up. Okay, there's no, not a lot of point because it's slowed. It's so slow at that point, and you increase the potential for environmental risk. So that's the take-home message of fall applied nitrogen. Do it early in the fall. You probably use soluble in sources to make sure that what you did apply is available for plant uptake, and do it at a time where. The plant has the maximum potential to take it up before it slows down into dormancy. That will increase the, the, the response you're going to get out of it and reduce the, the chances of any nitrogen being lost to the environment. That's kind of the take home message of this paper. So as we're going into the fall this year, I, I, you might find that useful to, uh, to consider whenever you're, you're scheduling your programs. Okay. Hope you guys found it helpful. Um, thanks for, for Aldo and Jay and whoever else uh, popped in to, to watch the, the stream today. I'm, I don't yet know my schedule on doing these things. I'm going to try to do them fairly regularly. Um, uh, we'll, we'll see what happens.